Hello, everyone. We're very fortunate to have Christina Barton, counselor at the Rochester Public Schools, and she is an advocate for students. She's a counselor inside Rochester Public Schools, ISD 535. And Ms. Christina Barton, Mrs. Barton, it's very nice to be with you this evening, and thank you for taking time to speak about this very important issue of uh, transgender policy in the Rochester Public Schools. Thank you, ma'am. Let me turn it over to you. We're Thank back. you, Mr. Lund, uh, for having me today. Call me back. <laughs> Um, I'm so happy to be here. It's a privilege to um, to advocate on behalf of parents and students and staff um, and just, you know, spread awareness and to um, speak on truth and have integrity doing so. It's wonderful. And uh, it was an exciting conversation that uh, I was a witness to. Uh, at Live 125 with Dr. Jean Marvin earlier this week, just, uh, oh, what was it, uh, Wednesday, was it, wasn't it? It was just, uh, anyway, it was just recently, I've had such a busy work schedule, I forgot. Uh, it was Wednesday. It was a listening session with the Rochester Public Schools, and uh, you really had a great conversation, and I, I felt like it was a, a dinner party to which I was invited, but I couldn't quite follow what people were talking about. It was highly intellectual. It was um, very courageous, the, the questions and concerns that you brought to the table. And of course, the uh, recordings for that. I lost your audio. Sorry. Okay. Off. You're, you're back. What were you expressing during that meeting? It was a tremendous dialogue. It was like a university class in transgenderism at the educational level. So <laughs> what was happening at that table? Sure. Um, so I was just basically speaking to um, Mrs. Barvin about some of my concerns that I had um, as a staff member, but also as a parent um, of, a, of a former RPS student. And I, one of the biggest questions that I have and other staff have, um, and even parents have, is why was this guideline for uh, for gender identity, uh, transgender and gender expansive students, why was this withheld from us when it was called into action on September 8th, 2023? And we were not shared this guideline until five months later um, on February 14th, Valentine's Day at a staff meeting. Um, and it seems that um, the question continues to be deflected. I can't get a answer for why this was not shared with staff and why this was not shared with the parents and the community taxpayers. Um, this is concerning to me. And one of the rebuttals is, well, it's not a hidden, it's, it's not a hidden guideline. It's not secret, but it is because it's not accessible. It was clearly um, written for administrators because that's how it is entitled, RPS Administrative Guidelines. Um, administrators were, from what Dr. Pakel has told me, is that they were trained in how to handle these issues if they come up by case by case um, without it being discussed with us as staff members. And this was um, this was um, first discovered through a pronoun staff development meeting um, where we were learning about how to quote carefully consider how we can encourage the use of pronouns with our students. And we were shown a very disturbing video about transgenderism and how we ought to um, withhold the information from parents out of fear of parents being retaliated 
uh, retaliating against their students or even abusing their their students. Um, and so that was very disturbing to me, along with other people. You could not hear a pin drop in the staff meeting because no one understood what was happening. No one knew about this. And we certainly uh, felt afraid to even speak. But I felt this compelling, and I'm going to say probably conviction, um, in my heart to say something. I, I knew I had two choices. I had a choice to either walk out because I did not agree with what was happening or I could be brave enough to speak out. And um, so I raised my hand and I simply asked, I, what I heard was um, through this video is that we should be removing parents from the conversation instead of inviting them to the conversation. I don't understand where the parents voices in this because mm -hmm. parents are the guiding voice of their child. They have parental rights. The Constitution says so. It is a fundamental right. It is an, it is an educational right. Um, and so I'm not understanding how that is going to help with the parent-child relationship, how that's going to help with the school-child-parent relationship. And we talk a lot about that at, our, at RPS, how family engagement is super important to the strategic plan. But if we are deceiving our parents, how are we helping them build that trust with the parents? Um, and so that is really concerning to me. And so um, what was discussed in the meeting was that um, there were concerns for abuse of the child and that our student is the first client. And I certainly understand protecting the child, but, it, but when it comes to something like this, that is very important that the parent rallies around the child and helps process that information with the child so they can provide that love and support and care for the child because that is their duty. It is a calling, it is a blessing to be rewarded, um, the, just the gift of parenthood. And we are called to steward over our children until they are 18 years old and even after that. But they have a legal right to steward over their children until they're 18. And if we are informed about everything else, we're informed about if our child is bullied at school, if we are informed that our child is bringing drugs and alcohol to school, if we are informed that our child is failing in school because academically they're struggling, if we are informing a, a parent because we need to potentially test or evaluate a child because they are scoring really low and we're concerned about developmental issues, why are we not, and, and also informing about even suicidal ideation, why are we not inviting the parent to the conversation so that way they can have a voice and they can have a role in their child's life instead of isolating them, where they're going to fall even more deeper into a depression and um, be, you know, and cause a wedge to be driven between that parent and child relationship. So I have a major issue with this um, because it's withheld. Parents don't even know that this exists. We didn't know that this existed until just recently as staff. And um, I cannot ethically uphold such a guideline morally and ethically as a school counselor, as a parent, and even as a Christian. Um, I will not lie to a parent um, because my job is to protect the child. And it is in their best interest to invite the parent to the conversation and to inform them so that way they can provide the right support and process that um, life changing decision with them. Um, we, I talked about how, you know, every child's um, brain is developing 
you know, science shows that the prefrontal cortex up here is not fully developed until they are at, at 25 years old. Sometimes girls will mature a little bit sooner than boys. Um, but that deals with our reasoning and our judgment. And the amygdala is on the side of our brain. And that deals with, um, with risk-taking behaviors. That deals with adrenaline. And that is over active during the stage of development. And so if we are simply operating on decisions because our adrenaline is telling us to do so, we're not allowing our kids to have the opportunity to understand that their choices have consequences later in life. They're not able to reason that out. They're not able to um, provide good judgment. And that's what a parent's voice does. It provides good judgment for the child that is that guiding voice um, that can help support the child and help them understand that every choice has a consequence and that we need to make good choices because not every choice is in the best interest of what we may think when we're a kid. We're very impressionable at this age. So that's why we need a parent to be that voice. Thank you, Christina. That's um, that's a great summation. You touch on the legal ramifications. You touch on the parental rights ramification, and um, I see a political dimension uh, always in a lot of things. But to divide the family uh, from the parent against the child, and the child is one of the most egregious things to do in a public mm -hmm. institution paid for by the parents, ironically, paid for by the society. And then they're telling people that, well, we're going to keep these secrets because uh, we're super afraid of, of the parent taking retaliation. It just, it seems to be a projection um, using, you know, what might happen to be an excuse to keep secrets from parents. Well, in case, I don't know, Certainly, everybody at school will know what other people are are up to, probably before the family does in some cases. But the school officials have a responsibility and a duty, I think, to reach out to parents and inform them what's going on. Some parents have have said that when they go to parent teacher conferences, they were, and this is this involves Mayo, but they were in the lunchroom or at tables where lots of other students could hear what was being discussed. But that's just sort of travelers news. They wanted to have private conferences with teachers, but instead they were in places where um, other families were nearby waiting to speak with the teachers. But to be clear about this policy, called the Rochester Public Schools Administrative Guidelines for Supporting Transgender and Gender Expansive Students uh, written or presented by I lost you again. Sorry. <laughs> Quick helicopter going. <laughs> it's a Canuck. Okay. Uh, of Friday, September 8th, 2023. So yeah. this policy was instituted by Superintendent Peckel. It says in paragraph one, Superintendent Peckel has directed that the following guidelines for supporting transgender and gender expansive students based largely upon the guidelines developed by the Minnesota School Boards Association are to be implemented and enforced in Rochester Public Schools. And he goes on. Now it's a six page document and we can try to provide that below, but this only became knowledge to the teachers just recently, right? Yes, that is correct. At least at our school, it was new knowledge to us. But I think it's also super important to bring up the very end of that paragraph that you were reciting. It says these administrative guidelines will, relate, will remain in force until the Rochester School Board develops and improves the policy and or procedures to support transgender and gender expansive students. The RPS school plans to undertake and complete that task during the 2023-2024 school year um, through the school, school board's ongoing policy developmental process. Now, it is my understanding that Dr. Pakel is the cabinet lead 
and he's the one who creates um, new proposals for the school board to vote on. Now, I recently um, emailed him regarding the day in which he choose in which he is supposed to um, propose this guideline to the school board to vote upon, and he has yet to email me back. It is something that I did ask Mrs. Marvin during our session on Friday, and she was unaware that they were even supposed to vote on it. So that's concerning in and of itself. That video has been uploaded to Rumble and is now available on Rumble. It's a document wherein Dr. Jean Marvin was unaware and it hadn't been brought before them and they weren't allowed to vote on it. It was a policy that was apparently new to her. She hadn't participated in a debate or discussion. It is so we can look at the Minnesota School Boards Association. Now, some people did want to try to infiltrate those meetings and we we are our, our folks were never able to do the M msba meetings to find out what they're planning for our kids but here's another level of bureaucracy the local school district should be much more involved like with public participation in the guidelines but uh, yeah. by the way and, and nobody is going after kids in terms of discussing this the, par the next paragraph talks about harassment and equal education opportunity violent bullying prohibition policy protection and privacy of pupil records sex non-discrimination policy and grievance procedure process um i'd like to point out i think two things if i can remember both points one is that with one of the big data uh, disruptions in Rochester Public Schools, somehow students' emails were released and then, then they received all those nasty messages, if you remember that in the newspapers last year, and we talked about this the school board meetings too. That was the reason for the technology. So the Rochester Schools and the Rochester Public Library both had data hacks around a period of time and individuals records were just, you know, they all received these nasty emails. But what do you when you talk about protecting students, nobody's going after these kids for any of their identities or their beliefs. This is a projection of some kind, an inverted attack. It's a, a, a creation of a victimhood status where. I, I, so, I'm so I'm an amateur. The, the tech, there's always some. <laughs> but um, we respect and uplift people's uh, interests, right? Yes. My second point is why then is the Rochester Public Schools so interested in sending out survey after survey after survey after survey that asks everyone personal questions about identity, about your gender bits, about mm -hmm. your, your sexual interests and your proclivities. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's okay. And parents have been complaining about this and taxpayers too all over social media why are why are they asking us all these questions about kids it, it seems like uh you know there's a term for that you know mm -hmm. step around and find out. why not just leave other people's kids alone mm -hmm. instead of trying to ask these questions all the time isn't that a privacy violation somehow i I feel like it softens people up to discuss these issues with government employees. And it makes your personal stuff, your personal, your life, if you can discuss that with another people's, another person's children, yeah. what's off the table at that point? Mm -hmm. what, else, what else is left? Leave other people's kids alone, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, well, I will tell you, um, Wes, that um, although I am not a lawyer, I, I do have a brain and I do know how to Google search um, different parts of the law 
when it comes to uh, parental rights and educational law. And so um, something that a lot of parents don't know, and, and this is really one of the fundamental reasons why I'm really wanting to make an awareness um, for parents is to empower parents to understand that they have rights and what those rights are so that way they can exercise those rights. And you spoke to um, some of the questions that are in those surveys or assessments, and that's actually not um, something that they're allowed to do unless it is um, consented by the parent first. So let me just read to you what it says. Um, federal law states that the First and Fourteenth Amendments FERPA, which a lot of parents are familiar with, that's when you can request those educational records um, of the student, and the Pupil Protection Rights Act, the PPRA, formerly known as the Hatch Amendment that was founded in 1939, um, it gives parents the right to have the ultimate authority as the guiding voice of their child to instill beliefs and values and are to have notice and consent before their child can be asked about certain subjects to include mental health, political affiliation, surveys, curriculum, religious affiliation, sexual behavior, attitude, and so much more. And so they are to be um, given, um, they're supposed to be informed and parents are supposed to be given information, um, consent first before they um, go ahead and do whatever it is that they're going to do but also to give a parent the opportunity to opt out if it's something that does not align with their beliefs or they don't agree upon, so. Fascinating. Um, I had um, a school employee uh, try to engage me in conversation about another uh, parent's child's affiliation, political affiliation, and mm. I, I uh, shrugged it off and I left it alone. I had another school employee uh, express concerns about a friend of mine's uh, uh, children and you know, kind of projecting issues onto uh, that person and their, it had to do with their political affiliation and their religious convictions. And they're trying to get engaged in conversation about somebody else's kids. Um, I find that level of uh, chicanery uh, ridiculous. When you try to talk with somebody else and, and stir up some kind of uh, gossip, bizarre. But um, back to this document, if I could, they talk about definitions. And they mm -hmm. say definitions contained in the policy are not in to label students. So <laughs> they don't seem to listen to themselves while they're writing. Listen, okay, here we go. All right. So if you're creating definitions, and then you say, we're not trying to label students. It just, it's like, do they read their own sentences? It sounds like a double standard. Well, the very act of creating definitions of different sexualities ends up creating labels. And then they go on to call it an identity and they call it a gender identity. So they uh, create all of these perceptions of uh, transgender, transgender nonconform, gender expansive, etc., gender expressive, ex and um, <laughs> almost like censorship, like we're not being, like we're not able to speak. Something I feel every day of my career. <laughs> So they say and that, retaliated uh, against. Yeah, it, it, one can expect that because we don't have much free speech left, but they create definitions. They say they're not trying to label students and then they label students and they say they want to respect students privacy 
And then they go on to ask students questions about their sexual interests and their sexual feelings, right? So does this go down in children's permanent records? Because their next their next part three of the policy is talking about officials. Oh. Is the government school? Can you hear me now? I can. Is the government school now in the business of documenting the student's legal name and gender? It includes it. Now, now they're saying the school district will change a student's official record to reflect the change in legal name or gender. Upon receipt of documentation that such change has been made pursuant to a court order for official government action. Well, that occurs in the case of divorces or separations, right? Or you're going to change a person's name, right? But now you can change your, anyway, now you can change your gender, I guess. And without court documentation. And so when I was in, when I was in Tennessee, um, it, if you were going to change your identity, it had to be through a court document and the parent had to be informed and supportive of that. Of course, they would have to in order to go to court. Um, but yes, and it, that is that is a concern because it talks about inadvertent language um, and that the staff would use discretion um, in the language that they would use with um, official school records. And so that makes me question whether or not they would be withholding that specific language um, from the official school records that would be requested versus what is actually discussed inside the classroom with preferred names or pronouns. So if you if you if you are a boy and you you're labeled uh, you're labeled by your doctor as male when you're born <laughs> if i'm if i'm labeled male when i'm born and i legally change my uh my gender if you will my identity or my expression and turn it into um female or some other thing i can be included in Uh, this constant noise on the line is uh, frustrating. So, uh, gender segregated activities. So, to the extent possible, schools should reduce or eliminate the practice of segregating students by gender. Now, mm -hmm. does that include bathrooms then, or locker rooms, or sports teams, or school trips? I mean, you might not want to answer that because, I mean, that is what I think the legal question is going to come down to case scenarios where a kid goes on a school trip and it's like, I don't know, it's three o'clock in the morning and the girl discovers that the other girl in the bed with her has a penis. Uh, or you're on a sports team and you've got to undress in the locker room and there's a boy there. Or uh, I mean, uh, a girl there who's on the girls' sports team who has a penis. Mm -hmm. So in that case, I mean, that you could get a kind of a rude awakening. I mean, where do students' privacy rights lay who are not presented as gender expansive or gen or gender? Um, I call it dysphoria, but that's bad to say. But <laughs> Where do the rights lie? What about the girls, the actual girls who understand that they are girls and they're on a girls team, mm -hmm. but now they have a guy. Don't those girls have privacy rights as well to be segregated, if, if you want to call it segregated, if they want to. Oh, I Nine programs, Title Nine programs were created in Minnesota so that girls would have full opportunity to have um, lifetime sports that would help them be healthy 
and make healthy choices about activities. So now you get involved with a sports team and there's a dude on it. So mm -hmm. for me, that's problematic. I'm a, you know, a, a stand, if I'm standing by watching that happen as a teacher. Yes. I mean, yeah, and, and this isn't just limited to sports. This is also limited to, um, this is also um, for any type of like overnight school field trip activity where there is not that protection that you're talking about. And that is something that we, you know, we have brought up is, is the district really ready for the, the lawsuits that could come as a result of a student being impregnated, a student being raped, a student being injured, a student being bullied because of this. And we're talking about all sides of this, not just the one side, but it really does put the student safety at risk. And isn't this is exactly what we're trying to do is to provide um, safety and well-being for the whole child. Um, so it's not a very good policy. So the policy may have been, I mean, I'm just speculating and the, the words are mine, but the policy may have been slipped in under the radar at a time mm -hmm. when Dr. Peckle was concerned about a lot of other things going on. I mean, it's just one more problem to have this conversation in public with the school board members, the elected school board members. Dr. Jean Marvin didn't know about this policy or no. she didn't Guideline. have that. So <laughs> It's a big problem and uh, restroom accessibility. The reality is um, if you go into the wrong bath, I mean, try that in a small town, right? <laughs> so the saying goes, if you're at a department store and your daughter is in the bathroom with a man or a woman walks into the men's room or a girl walks into the men's room, that's a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's real life. The real, the real. Yep. <laughs> the, the technology bites. That's a problem in the world where uh, people learn about consequences like you were saying earlier people need to learn about consequences i mean if you do that in uh mexico or guatemala or argentina you are going to get a big lesson in cause and effect it you know in any latino culture where you know all of the words are masculine and feminine even the adjectives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of the words are conjugated for masculine and feminine. Even a, a pen has gender. Uh, so, but everything conforms to the masculine and the feminine. Romance languages cannot be devoid, whether it's Latin, Portuguese, French, even German has male and female nouns. Nouns, masculine and feminine. But here we are in the United States scrambling our brains over... English, which is the least uh, <laughs> English, we don't have masculine and feminine words like nouns and adjectives. Mm -hmm. But um, now we're going to let boys in the girls' bathrooms. Do, do they and locker room accessibility? The the mm -hmm. policy deals with the use of locker rooms quote, by transgender and gender expansive students shall <laughs> on a basis with the goals of maximizing the student's social integration and equal opportunity to participate in physical education classes and sports and other school activities, ensuring the student's safety and comfort and minimizing stigmatization of the student. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a very strange policy. This high, uh, I can't believe Dr. Peckle wrote this and I wonder if this isn't, if this isn't a, cookie cutter policy, if you were to run this through Grammarly and check it for plagiarism, I wonder if we wouldn't find the same policy turning up in other places. In fact, that's something that should be tried if anybody wants to take the, I should try to post this policy uh, in a nice form on the internet. One, feel free to take it for plagiarism. Let's find out where it came from. Sure. Uh, and you know you you brought up a good point. I just wanted to insert really quickly, if I may. Um, 
You asked at the other um, the other day during our discussion if this guideline was in other languages, and she said yes, but that's actually not true. It is actually only in English. Um, and I will tell you that we disseminated this information within the community to the Arabic community and also the Somali community. And language was a big barrier for us because obviously we don't speak those languages. Um, and I think that this is clearly a guideline that needs to be disseminated in all languages so that yes, way yes. all parents can understand what's happening and that way they can feel empowered to exercise their parental rights. Okay, okay. hold on that. The scaffold on what you just said. Given that this was re released September 8th, the school board referendum, everything, the passions were high about the school board referendum. And I had done several posts about the amount of money which the teachers union had spent uh, translating all of the promotional materials for the referendum into seven, eight, nine different languages. It seems to me that the amount of and I want to challenge Dr. Marvin said, oh, yes, we have a very nice system. You can hover over it, click it. I'm not talking about the school translator. And she said, oh, we have it in Arabic and Spanish. Uh, no, I think you did this into Arabic and Spanish because if the imam at the moment saw this, all the Somali would have voted differently. In Well, I don't know. I, I'm always mixing things with politics. But this is kind of a political agenda. It's a narrative that's being pushed on teachers, whether they like it or not, and students, whether they like it or not. And I know Hispanic people, they would not approve of their daughters uh, sharing a bedroom or a hotel room with a boy on a school trip. Right. Not cool for, for the Hispanics. For the Somalis, that would be a big problem. Boys and girls uh, sharing interscholastic competitive sports teams, uh, dress code compliance, discrimination, harassment, bullying. See, anybody who disagrees with them is always a bull. Yes. Oh, can you hear me? I hear you now, that noise. Okay. And, and I spoke and I spoke to that at the board meeting. I have been I have been warned um, by our union to not bring this to the public because it will quote piss off certain board members and you will not um, have your contract renewed. I have been threatened by both my administration and our superintendent that if I do not comply and I out a child, I will face ramifications, um, including job retaliation up to termination. So this is this is a fundamental issue as well that our staff cannot use their voice to speak out, and that is also another reason why. I am standing up and saying, absolutely not. You will not muzzle me and you will not muzzle our employees. We are educated professionals who love our students very dearly. And not all of us agree with this agenda or indoctr indoctrination, if you will, because it is our job to educate, not indoctrinate. And our test scores, if we may, if I might just, you know, add that. Uh, let's just talk about our test scores, shall we, for RPS. As of 2022, our test scores were 
in decline by 10% in math. Our science and reading scores were in decline by 6%. Our district scores are drastically declined, yet we're allocating our resources that are funded by the government, which by the way, our country pays three times per pupil than any other country, yet RPS is falling behind in scores. My question is, where are we putting that extra money when we have major mental health issues in our school system, we have major special needs in our school system, we have major academic needs in our school system, and we need supportive interventions to help with those barriers, not indoctrinating our kids on things that do not belong in the school, but belong at home. Very well said, and you you mentioned that that term outing a student. Mm -hmm. You know that projection again from the union or from administration that that fear that projection of you're outing a student. No, nobody's remotely interested in outing. It, nobody is is at all talking about parading or a scarlet letter. At all interested in the adults are charged with responsibility and the duty of taking care of children's academic needs and helping them learn how to function in society. And we're just like at on this uh, inverted attack that they're making against those kids by constantly infusing every conversation with some sexual aspect or some sexual dimension. How about you just find your own business? How about they stop talking? You know, just leave the kids alone. Let them be children. All right? Learn how to function in the world. Teach them how to balance a checkbook. You know, you want them to pay their taxes. You better teach them how to do something in the future. But it's a multi-layered, multi-dimensional attack and assault on students' minds and yes. ability to become productive members of society. It's creating a kind of illness in our society that is just to me, it's incredibly reprehensible. And to think that the public wasn't involved and school board members claim that they weren't involved in any discussions. The ones that are the angry ones are probably the ones that did this. And I don't know, but you just, I, I know some of the school board members, very nice people, but there's some activists on the board that are first and foremost ideologues. Um, also, um, Brave New World was a dystopian science fiction book. It wasn't meant to be a guideline about how to run the Rochester Public Schools. I mean, Brave New World should not be, it's just coming to pass. It shouldn't be part of this. So in this conversation with Dr. Marvin, she promised she was going to follow up on some issues. Did, did she do any follow-up yet? Have you had any communication following up on these really important issues? Th that dialogue was a tremendous dialogue. It was like watching a platonic dialogue with two interlocutors, you know, <laughs> these antithesis, uh, not so much synthesis, but still, it was a fascinating conversation, but you know, and and I attribute a lot of that to my amazing professors at the university where I went to college and they were amazing mentors and they still are. And it's really great because, you know, when I bring issues up to them, they're able to give me really good sound feedback and have that intellectual conversation um, with respect. And I think that's really important. Um, but no, I have not um, heard uh, back from uh, Ms. Marvin um, nor Dr. Piquel. He still has not emailed me back regarding a specific date um, for which they are supposed to meet. But um, if I if I may just kind of piggyback off of what you're saying about the outing of the student, I really want um, I want viewers to understand that. Um, you know, some people do say that outing a student could potentially result in family abusing or neglecting their child. 
but we can't be the family police. That's not our job. Um, but it would be a grave mistake if this were a blanketed policy. Um, and however, in order to safeguard our children who may risk abuse or neglect, we are mandated reporters and we would, you know, report any type of abuse and neglect if that was um, if that was made known to us by our students. Um, however, we don't know every parent or child, but it would be far worse to remove an integral part of um, our team, which would be a parent and school um, and student uh, by removing the parent from that conversation um, by not notifying them. So I hear that a lot in my arguments, but yet, um, I mean, you know, as a mom, and I'm not sure if you're a parent, but as a mom, anytime that my son is in trouble, uh, you know, he always, he always um, respectfully fears what his mom is going to say, like, oh, no, mom is going to be upset with me because I lied, or mom is going to be upset with me because I might not have made good choices at school today, or mom is going to be upset with me because this, that, the other, right? Yeah, but, even it, but it's our job to steward over our children and to provide that corrective conversation and discipline if it's needed to our children. So to say that kids are afraid of their parents isn't necess doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to abuse their child. It simply just means that a parent is going to take due course and have that conversation with their child and provide that corrective action. Um, you know, if they are, if, you know, if they had a bad day at school or they were disrespectful to their teacher or if they lied or if they stole or if they brought drugs or alcohol to school or if they bullied another student, it's their job to parent their kids. Um, but most parents, you know, parents are, they love their kids and they are the experts of their kids. And they are going to want to provide a loving, supportive um, environment to have that conversation and process that decision with them. Well, that's really important to respect that because um, I have noticed, it seems to me that quite a few of the teachers, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, it's one thing to be a teacher and to be taking care of other people's children it's quite another thing to have your own child yeah and i noticed you know once upon a time when you had teachers uh you know teaching was a profession that women would get into and then when if they got married then they were expected to quit and and raise their i mean that's i'm talking about 100 years ago mm -hmm. talking about you know uh, little rascals type stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, traditional gender roles yeah yeah well you i look around the room and it seems to me that there's quite a lot of teachers. good thing the sound went out I, I was saying i was saying it seems like there might be some teachers who don't have children and maybe aren't interested in having any children and so when you got a child and it's a blessing. It's a, the experience of being a parent is a blessing yeah. because you learn about yourself, learn more about the world, and you start to look at your parents differently. You know, yes, you you know, do. So, so when you have your own offspring, yeah. then you respect life a lot more yeah. than when you're in the age where I'm gonna, I wanna travel and I wanna, you know, you know, that age of just enjoying a $7 Starbucks every day, um, <laughs> having that disposable income, you know, as opposed to um, being actually Amazing. <laughs> We have a lot of supervisors in Rochester, a lot of like chatty Cathy's that want to be parents to other people's kids. And it's kind of a phenomenon of like uh, very governmental people feeling like, oh, uh, maybe I don't have any kids or I have an empty nest now and I'm going to become supervisor of other 
people's children. It's, it's kind of unhealthy because you, that child has a parent and you're not their parent. So buzz off. But <laughs> that conversation that you had with Dr. Marvin was the most interesting conversation in the room. And I thought there were some people who came who didn't want to have public conversation. And if they didn't want to have a public conversation, they should. Some of them said they wanted their discussion to be private. Well, in that case, this happened before you arrived, so you didn't hear. So they um, said they wanted to speak privately. In which case, well, why don't they make an appointment with Dr. Marvin or whomever and go speak with them in private? You don't have to come to a public place and talk about private issues, but. Um, the conversations were held under the Delphi meeting. Yep. <laughs> so I'll see. Um, and I find that sound to be an incredible distraction. It's uh, an amazing noise to have on the line, trying to have a decent conversation. Um, about the privacy, I think we used to have structures in place for just leaving other kids alone. Is there an element of discrimination, harassment, and bullying by a project by the people who pretend to be respecting students' rights? If you are forcing other people to engage in speech patterns, like compelling speech, compelling other people to use pronouns, is that a violation of another person's constitutional rights? I think that's kind of an issue. Like, you can't make me say something. You can't demand that I say something. Like, I have to accept your um, usage of terminology or your creation of terminology. Um, that's, that's cool. I'm so sorry. I have no idea what's going on with the internet, uh, but that's, that's okay. One of one of the things that my son, um, he was obviously very brave, and I'm so proud of him for speaking out the other night with me. That was totally his choice, and it's something that he had wanted to speak out about quite a long time ago. Um, and it's something that you know we have processed, and I just said let's just wait and let's just prayerfully, you know, um, consider when it is that it's, it's a good time to talk about this. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like um, his voice matters and um, his experience matters. And um, one of the things that he did leave out the other day, but I did um, disclose to Dr. Pakel and Jackie Peterson when I met with them privately prior the day prior to the school board meeting, school board meeting was that um, my son was asked on the first day of class what his pronoun was and he had never been asked that in his entire educational experience and he said um, I'm not exactly sure like why you're asking me that because I'm a, I was born a boy, I plan to stay a boy, and God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And, and I had to chuckle just because I thought, wow, good for you. You are advocating for, you know, your, your beliefs, as you should. Wow. Um, but to, like you said, to be compelled to um, use that language with his peers that would not be true or equitable to who he is and what he believes um nor would it be true or equitable to other people who don't share that same um belief and so i, I think when we talk about equity because that's a big issue nowadays the dei it almost makes me question so who are we really protecting are we protecting only a certain group of people or are we protecting all people? Um, and so it, it seems like some of these guidelines are protecting um, only specific groups of people and um, we're placating on um, what they are 
wanting and not really hearing the voice of the community or even the voice of um, our, our students and what they feel too. So I, I find that interesting and, you know, um, a national poll um, from the Canadian Research Center um, said that 75% of parents are not on board with withholding um, guidelines or secrets from them. And that the poll concluded that parents wish to be informed on, on all, all aspects of their child's safety, wholeness, and well being. So, fracturing trust with families in our community is diverting time, resources, and energy away from teaching and learning, but it's also fracturing the trust um, even with students within their own school, um, feeling like they are not represented, as my son mentioned. that there are specific flags that are representing a certain demographic but aren't representing the United States of America for which this country was founded on um, in addition to other belief systems too. Oh, oh. there we go. <laughs> this is crazy. Um, you know, we used to actually have groups in Rochester, such as uh, Take Back the Night, which was uh, a march that was held every year to call for safe streets and an end to violence and, you know, putting more street lamps out. So um, Take Back the Night was something that was done on a yearly basis. That's gone away. Uh, there was another group called Minnesota Girls Are Not For Sale. And that group was around for about 20 years. It was trying to uh, decrease incidents of uh, prostitution and so forth and trafficking. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where that group went, but there was another group called Mission 21 that was uh, rescuing women from trafficking. And uh, that uh, we did a fundraiser for them a couple of years ago, but that group seems to have gone away too. But what we have in its place are these lofty latitudes and platitudes in the form of these policies to try mm -hmm. to institute correct thinking and correct speech that don't really protect anybody and in fact uh, kind of like stir things up. It's almost like it's designed to kind of challenge the status quo and introduce mm -hmm. an element of, of uh, sexuality in an already highly charged sexual environment where young people are learning to become young men and young women around each other. And how do you interact with men and women? And it creates a lot of dysphoria surrounding gender relationships between men and women and boys and girls. And it encourages it, like you say, at a time when their prefront prefrontal cortex is not yet developed, you should not be imprinting your political narrative and ideology on people who are still like warm wax. You know, you can make an impression on them. They're stamping them. Yeah. And to have that in your record, I mean, you might, you might be experimenting with certain things as a kid or child, you know, you're, as a high schooler, you might be experimenting a little bit. Um, you might try to smoke a joint and then discover that you don't like that at all. You might try cigarettes. You might take a drink of alcohol at a party and decide that's not for you. But to put something on people that's going to be written down and caught by, it's just, it's bizarre. It just, leave them alone. I say leave them alone. Let them be kids. Teach them something useful. Exactly. So, and I think what you're speaking to, and, and it, from a from a psychological standpoint, it sounds like a mere exposure effect. It's it's a psychological phenomenon um, by which people tend to develop a preference for things or people that are familiar to them than others. So it's it's a marketing strategy, right? Let's say that we see um, well, we don't have Hardee's here, but. We have a Hardee's commercial, right? Oh, and we yeah. see we see this beautiful lady just eating this amazing burger and making it really look good. And yeah. we see it repeated over and over and over again. It is going to play on the psyche of the person watching. And so it will increase that that repeated exposure will increase that familiarity and will certainly, like you said, impression a 
developing child who um, clearly needs the guiding voice of a parent to help them discern between right and wrong. Yeah, it, that's very well said. And uh, why create a bias preference towards something? Just because it's familiar, and you keep saying it over and over again, it, it shows you how you can gaslight a whole population. Uh, I, to me, I see another, you know, a bunch of a whole set of problems that we yeah. can talk about for a whole nother hour. And I guess I got to say that something that impressed a whole group of people who I spoke to um, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and I, I spoke with uh, two crowds on Tuesday after the school board meeting that night. And uh, what everybody said, I said there was a 11 or 12 year old boy who spoke at the school board meeting tonight. And because they asked me to make a, a little presentation about what happened at the school board Tuesday in Tuesday morning's meeting. And then I, I, so I said there was a boy who stood up and he spoke about thus and such, you know, what we, we've been discussing. And, you know, he was so proud of himself for the his finding his voice and speaking and i said let that be an inspiration to all of us because quite a few of the people were in the crowd and they were i said if the 11 year old can do it then so can you why don't yeah. you sign up to speak at the school board meeting why don't you sign up to speak at the city council meeting or the county commissioners meeting or the library get involved and show up to those meetings ask them why is, doing this and i'm against that policy become the board become the board of education do you think you have a future in in uh politics you're gonna run for something you think um, about <laughs> well um i i will tell you that i absolutely love politics my son and i will watch um we do have a little bit of a bias. We do watch Fox News all the time. I have never met a, my son actually turned 13 next month. Happy birthday, Braxton. So proud of you. Um, <laughs> and, but I have never watched a little boy um, watch the news as much as him. He, I, I genuinely believe that God has great plans and purposes for his life. Just like I tell my students all the time, except that I don't use the word God. I just say you have great plans and purposes for your life. Um, uh, but I tell him that every single day and he's like, mama, I know you tell me all the time. You don't need to tell me every day. I'm like, well, I just want you to really understand that you really do. But I do think that he has a political future. I am open to whatever God has for me. Um, I do feel like God has called me to speak out, um, about, um, a lot of, a lot of these issues when it pertains to education and our children and making sure that we are that guiding voice because we are to train our children up in the way they should go that they will not depart from the word and um i believe wholeheartedly that this is my calling is to be an advocate and so whatever he has planned for me i am I'm, I'm just a vessel and I'm happy to let him use me however he chooses. Um, but I will say I, I am, a, like I said, I am a proud conservative Republican, um, but I am happy to, you know, be like Ronald Reagan and, and Abraham Lincoln and, and come to the table and work with people from the other side and, and um, unite and come together for the better good of the country. So... Thank you for that. And the, the last thing I'd say is the smile on your son's face after he sat down and he looked, and he looked back at me and he went like this. And I went, you know, it, he's <laughs> a kid. And he children is. are a gift from God. And who have children understand that our children don't belong to us in the sense of that we own them like some right. chattel. But our children definitely do not belong to the public schools or the government. I mean, that's, that's, right. that's talking. Children are, uh, parental rights are uh, just prima facie, uh, supersede the government entanglements. And uh, 
That is I, that is true. And what one thing I wanted to say to you, um, Wes, I think it's. This is really important, and I, and I really had hoped to say this um, to the school board the other day, especially to Dr. Pacal, because I think this is important. You know, um, I always say to my son, we ought to practice what we preach. That's very important in life, um, as well as standing on truth and integrity. And I said that at the beginning of the speech. Um, and I, I want to speak to what Dr. Patel has said about um, parent-child relationships in his research, and I'm not sure if you dug a little bit, but um, research is something that's really important to me. And I wanted to just say, just um, state some quotes that he yeah, said, if with, you don't mind. I don't, I don't mind, and I think we should do actually a whole other session on uh, his organization, Search Associates. His oh. not. And maybe we could talk about the Bill and Melinda Gates donation to Dr. Peckle. Oh. As a donation from the Eli Lilly, uh, Lilly Corporation Pharmaceuticals gave of him. Indiana, Indianapolis. Okay. He's well endowed in terms of the financial underpinnings of his nonprofit. So we can mm. talk about that directly. And I have some contacts in the Twin Cities. and um, But Dr. Peckle and search his search group are a big money tree. That's that's very interesting. That's new news to me, but now you have me very yeah. curious. Um, and his wife, Katie Peckle, is connected to Dr. Muhammad Halifa at the University of Minnesota. And yeah. so it's part of a yeah, I like the I like the research a little bit. So I'm sorry yeah. we we never met before and we didn't really know each other and all of this sort of organically happened and yeah. now i think other whistleblowers there's people in the schools who really want to come forward they're just waiting for the right moment and you may have broke opened the dam i'm gonna i'm gonna be quiet now i promise okay no it's okay and you know that is my hope that is my prayer is that parents will feel that they have a voice. They are empowered to have that voice. Staff has that voice. Um, so, and even, you know, community taxpayers, these are school officials. So they ought to hear the voice of the community and consider it without whatever implicit bias they have. They, it should be blinded. So that way they can make the right decision for the community since we are the ones who fund the school system after all, right? But right. Um, I find it that, I find it interesting um, that I, I had quoted all of the statistics earlier about how, you know, 75% of parents are not on board with, you know, hiding secrets, um, according to the CRC. Yet, our superintendent states that schools should help families strengthen parent-child relationships. Evidence for adopting that approach comes from a search institute study entitled Don't Forget the Families. That is something that he had, um, had, had created. He, uh, he states the powerful role that parent-child relationships play in the child's learning and development. Parents should be informed of the onset of a guideline such as this so that it doesn't fracture the, the inherent trust between parents and schools or even drive a wedge between the parent-child relationship. Um, we need to have elected officials who are willing to invite parents to the table and truly listen to their voices, who speak truth, who are transparent, with the community and vote without implicit biases. Now, here is his direct quote. Um, he says, quote, it is not particularly novel to say that parent-child relationships matter, but it is new to suggest that schools should help families strengthen them. Evidence for adopting that approach comes from a just released search institute study, don't forget the families. Don't forget the families, a major study that finds that the quality of parent-child relationships is 10 times more powerful than demographics. In predicting whether children are developing critical character strengths, such as being motivated to learn, being responsible, and caring for others. Based on a national survey of a diverse sample of 1,085 parents of three to 13 year olds, our research underscores the powerful role that parent-child relationships play in children's learning and development. 
Our study also finds that parents from all backgrounds are very interested in receiving support that helps them strengthen family relationships. How, so my question to him, this is rhetorical of course, but how does withholding information from parents and not being transparent build that family engagement? Henceforth, encourage the parent-child relationship. Now, he has also another article entitled Integrity, Ethics, and the CIA. I think you're familiar with his history of working for the CIA. CIA. Let me yes. pull the questions. Yeah, <laughs> I'm familiar with Dr. Peckle's CIA career, yeah. He doesn't yes. know either, but well, go, well, go ahead. Yeah. No, that, this, is, this is actually, I, I find this quite humorous. Um, CIA. All about keeping secrets, right? I mean, well, it's I, you, exactly. You know. It's like the antithesis of being transparent. It almost seems. <laughs> the he same said, group that dropped heroin into, uh, you know, the same group that did cocaine into Miami, crack into New York, and you know, running drugs and guns through Panama into. Uh, this is all me. Sorry, this is me talking. And he had nothing to do with that. I'm just, uh, I'm just, yeah, the CIA is all about assassinating people and overthrowing governments, causing revolution, creating instability in societies, learning how to infiltrate, identify, infiltrate, and destroy. And he, he thinks he's going to reform the CIA. And now he turns up as an educator in, in Rochester, Minnesota very meteoric rise to power um i i promised i would be quiet didn't i no and, and no and that's okay because and as you know that um his some of his educational background is in asian studies as well as education and he also spent a lot of time in wuhan china ironically um and so he, he quotes, being ethical implies doing the right thing. Having integrity implies doing the right thing even when it hurts, end quote. <laughs> and then he has another quote, when people fear they will be blamed for anything short of, of an optimal in, uh, outcome, pressure is created to do whatever it takes to achieve that outcome, including cutting ethical corners and covering up mistakes, end quote. Now here's my question for him. If this is the principle that you write about and believe in, then why aren't you practicing what you preach by being forthcoming with staff, parents, and the community with this guideline? So did you buy his book, the, the one about reforming the CIA? No, I just looked online. I just did my own research. Oh, because it's available. <laughs> you can find it in different corners online. but. Okay. Uh, no, so he was selling it on Amazon. Doc, or he was selling his book on reforming the CIA on okay. Amazon.com. And I screenshot that, and it was available for the low, low price of like $980. And it was being published and sold from a book repository in Dallas, Texas. So you could mm -hmm. call, you could buy it on Amazon for from Dr. Peckle. And then when I called the place, I said, how many copies do you have on hand? Because uh, it's so expensive, it must be a rare book. They said, we print it when we get an order. So if you order the book on Amazon, it, then they, they like print it and they mail it to you. So for the low, low price of $900. Now, everybody knows a book deal. Everybody knows what a book deal is when you get out of government. You do a book deal. Everybody buys your book. The Clintons you know. should know all about that. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely as smart as like Henry Kissinger. Nobody would read his books, but, you know, he would write it. He just kept writing them. And they're like that. It's like the brothers Karamazov. It's like, oh, Kissinger wrote another book. Oh, well, who's got <laughs> enough time in life to read it all? But, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you did you want to say anything else about that? Because he clearly doesn't. He doesn't abide by this. If you've seen his resume, it's all redacted. And I don't know how the board hired him. His mm. resume, well, it mentions the Wuhan China gig. and okay. But all of that 
you know, I can send you his resume if you want to see it. But do you want to see the version or the redacted version? That's anyway. Well, let's, let's compare and contrast, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> if uh, this has been the start, do we? I think this is the start of a beautiful friendship because it's yes. got around here. I think we got to do a part two. Yeah. Once more things, let's let some more in the fullness of time. We may revisit some of these things because I don't. Sometimes I just I grieve for this town because we used to have the best schools in Minnesota. I mean, John Marshall and Mayo and Lourdes High School. And uh, Lourdes is doing very well and enrollment is up, and more and more people are in the public schools and choosing to homeschool. So, um, speaking of enrollment, I think it's enough. It's something else that I had, it was another specific statistic. So, I'm just going to quickly throw this in. Go and for this, it. speaks, it's, this speaks to the concern, I think, that parents have within the community about our district. Um, RPS has dropped 3.5 percent since 2019 which was at its peak enrollment meanwhile private and online schools have had their highest enrollment yet so my question is why lack of quality and the children feel safe i know of, of girls who've gone home and they said mom dad i'm not going back i'm not back to that building so you got to figure something else out because I'm not going back. And the Rochester Public Schools lost a thousand students per year. And I didn't hear what it was this year, right? The enrollment, is the enrollment down again? Or are they thinking that they're going to bring in an influx? I mean, how will, what's going to fix the, this year, what's the decline in student numbers? Did it go down another? I'm not sure. So that was as of 2022 for both the test scores and the enrollment percentages. I um, I do not have the most recent numbers. I do know that with the with the um, shutdown for the cybersecurity breach, we did not have MCAs last year. So um, and I know that that's getting ready to start. Um, so we'll, we should have some new numbers, um, hopefully maybe later on this fall but as far as enrollment i'm not exactly sure what those numbers are for this year but those were the most current that i could find on minnesota department of education yeah. well, 3.5 is significant and it was uh i know it was a thousand a year during covid and then enrollment going down 3.5 percent probably because you're losing some of the better students who throw up their hands and they say or their parents say uh, I'm done, or they'll leave the district in order to not have their public schools. And I know kids that their folks are paying money to send their kids to Dover and Iota and to other communities. I know a, a family, they moved to Byron to get away from the Rochester public schools. They actually changed, they, they lifted up their lives and they packed out. And um, this guy, Peckle, uh, should take a hard look at his policies and procedures. In my opinion, everything I say mm -hmm. in this video is on me and uh, doesn't reflect on you at all. I um, People should be looking really hard at him because after Dr. Munoz was let go for plagiarism. That's what I heard. <laughs> letter, thank you uh, thing he sent to the teachers and it's nothing like uh, using school resources to promote um, a political agenda in anyway this has been a most enlightening conversation and <laughs> everybody appreciates you and what you did last week the various activities and um, I'm sure other people will want to interview you too to um, their communities know what is going on as we're not getting a lot of information out of the Rochester Public Schools. And also this document, I am definitely going to follow up and insist that I be provided with the translation into Spanish and into um, Mali. Mm -hmm. I am this the mosque. I'm taking this to the Imam. The imam
I think the imams of Rochester and the Somali community would be highly interested in knowing about uh, policy and procedure. So um, I'll take it to the Spanish Hispanic churches as well. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your advocacy and your support. It has been such a pleasure meeting you. And, you know, um, I like to end with a, with a, a wonderful quote, you know, um, evil prevails when good men remain silent. And this is something that we cannot remain silent of if we want to take back the future of our children and their children. We have to take that back and we have to be able to implement all of the wonderful um, beliefs and values and traditions that we founded this country on. And um, we have to empower parents that they have a voice and not to let the government or any type of school institution or union to take that away from us. So thank you so much for the opportunity.